the hug was one of the, the pivotal moments of Bitfinex. That was incredible. I think by by in seven months, I think by by April 2017, all the outstanding DFX tokens were either you know converted, redeemed, or or converted in in, in equity. The really simple idea around Tether was okay. Let's reuse the incredible technology that uh, Bitcoin created called blockchain. Let's just put the US dollar because it's the most used currency in the world. I always say that before 2022, we never had even a marketing team for Tether. So Tether USDT has becoming really important for hundreds of millions of people across the board, especially in emerging markets and developing countries. Welcome to AppCenter, the show which talks about the technology projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane and I'm today here with Frederike Ernst. Today we're speaking with Paulo Ardorino, who is the CEO and co-founder of Tether and CTO of Bitfinex, and also working on another new thing called Hole Punch, which we'll talk about. So, of course, some enormously influential projects in the crypto space. Uh, most import- most of this Tether, so we're really excited to get to get into this. Just before we talk with Paulo, uh, a few words from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit gnosispay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Paul, thanks so much for coming on. It's really great to have you. Thank you for having me. we get right into it. I mean, you've been in crypto for a really long time and have worked on many different things, but how did it all start? Like, how did you become interested in crypto and what triggered your imagination? So 2024 is my 10th year in business in crypto. You know, I discovered Bitcoin in 2013. So I've been a developer all my life. Now I'm focusing more on business and um, strategy, but uh, I was born as a developer since I was eight years old, like was coding. You know, I was living in a really small town outside of the city and uh, didn't have many friends around. So, you know, I, I spent almost all of my afternoons with a computer. So fast forward, went to the university in Genoa in Italy and studied math applied to computer science. Um, and um, my... I'm also a big sci-fi fan, so my dream and my interest in technology was all about building things, building technological solutions that would be resisting to apocalypse, right? So, you know, in the how sci-fi, you there's always problems for the world, you know, things getting for uh, going for the worst. You have either wars or you have aliens or you have to abandon the earth and go somewhere else and so on. So. That that's that thing in in always 
uh, was sticking to my mind on how, you know, whatever we do, whatever we build should not be built for the best case scenario, but uh, should be built for the worst case scenario. And so, you know, I, I started, as soon as I graduated with from the university, I got one of the most interesting jobs uh, ever as a researcher in, in, at the university. So I was building resilient uh, telecommunication systems for distressed situations like battlefields. And, um, you know, that taught me how to be, you can build um, really resi resilient networks that are, you know, really critical and crucial in certain moments. Then, as most of the time happens in Italy, you don't pay, you don't get paid too much. Um, so, you know, the, <laughs> that's um, the unfortunately situation of, uh, um, of Italy. So I decided to move to a field that uh, I, I thought was more rewarding, at least uh, in economical pay, that was finance. So I got my first job in finance in uh, in actually in Switzerland, and then I decided to move in Lond to London to open my startup to build the financial software. So in 2012 I opened this startup, and uh, in 2013 I I was uh, already really annoyed by the outdated technology that the financial system was relying on. If you haven't worked with uh, banks or hedge funds and so on, you know that every time they trade anytime a trader trades for an institution for a hedge fund. At the end of the day, you have to reconcile all the positions, all the trades, all the cash balances across multiple trading venues, across multiple banks and custodians. And all that is speaking tens of different protocols, is kept together by rubber and bands, is all really outdated. Feels like it's all still written in COBOL uh, 40 years ago. So in 2013, I got the chance to learn about Bitcoin. And um, the first thing that I thought about Bitcoin was, okay, this is really cool. This is uh, not, not just, I didn't get immediately, honestly, the humanitarian and social implications. But I got the technology aspect and I thought that Bitcoin could be um, the solution for the financial board in terms of having a common settlement network across all the institutions, across all the governments. The beautiful thing about Bitcoin as a blockchain is that you can, everyone that has a synced node sees the same thing, right? So you, you cannot have errors in reconciliation and so on. So it's beautiful, it prevents double spending and, and, and so on. So I was really excited about it. And then at the end of 2013, I thought really, I was really deep in the rabbit Whole, and so I started understanding more how Bitcoin is actually a game changer as a currency for and its social impact could be incredible. So long story short, in 2014, I got the chance of, um, of uh, working for Bitfinex. So Bitfinex was one of the first trading platforms, was really one of probably the only and first trading platform that at the time was offering margin trading. On Bitcoin. And so the CFO, Giancarlo Di Vasini of uh, Bitfinex, contacted me through a common friend and we uh, he asked my uh, help in, in making sure that Bitfinex could scale with the demand, right? 2014 is not 2024. Of course, we are seeing today that the huge demand of, of Bitcoin, um, you know, brought by, by ETFs and so on. But in 2014, still there was a uh, an increase in demand for uh, for for accessing Bitcoin trading, and so most of the exchanges in 2014 were built by amateur is not the right term is is uh, is not about you know being uh, but we're more mostly almost e commerce is for Bitcoin rather than high performance trading platforms. Today we are used to have super low latency, high frequency trading, and so on. But back in time was kind of different. So I brought my expertise in, in building in building the you know the Bitfinex platform um, and the setting up a team. In 2016, I became the CTO of Bitfinex, and uh, in uh, 2017, I became the C CTO of uh, also Tether. And then uh, from there, I started working also on the stablecoin side um, for Tether. And um, more recently, I started to care more about. Um, long-term strategy, uh, vision, 
and uh, grow with all the teams and execution of um, the strategy for, for Tether. While still, I'm the CTO for Bitfinex, so I take care of the tech platform and uh, all the trading tools built around Bitfinex. So this is just me in, ten, in five minutes, probably more, but... Yeah, no, no. Thank you so much for uh, for that. I'm curious, like going a little bit into sort of the story of Bitfinex, what do you think it was that helped Bitfinex um, succeed? And and actually, there's maybe one episode I'd really be curious to talk, if you girls to talk about. It. I think some people will still remember it, right? Because once you guys had this massive hack and then you had this very interesting way of like dealing with the hack that I think ended up working out really well. But I'd also love if you could sort of talk through that episode and what happened then. I think that's right. I think the hack was one of the the pivotal moments of Bitfinex. Uh, remember that um, the word was coming, well, the Bitcoin word was coming from um, a big hack that was the Mongox hack. Right. So at that time when Bitcoin and Phoenix was hanged, it was uh, personally a devastating moment. Uh, also for, of course, for the company, for, for our customers. But look, we had two choices. Either let it go and let uh, Bitfinex potentially die, or we could roll up our sleeves and make sure that our customers would get whole. Right. So... At the time when Bitfinex was hacked was um, the 2nd of August, 2016, uh, Bitcoin was around $600. So the total loss of, um, of Bitfinex was around $72 million, so around 119,000 Bitcoin. So we decided, so I remember those days really well because after the first day or so of assessment of what happened and how it could have happened and so on, we uh, decided to come up with a plan to resume trading and make everyone whole. And the way that um, we used was um, actually new and um, I think was um, extremely intelligent and uh, forward thinking. So um, we dollarized the $72 million and we issued um, the, the so-called BFX tokens and we distributed the, the BFX tokens across um, the product across the, the users. And so also we opened a market for these BFX tokens so that people could um, trade their, um, their um, basically these IUUs. The interesting thing is that these tokens had multiple functions, right? So people could take these tokens and convert them into equity if they believed that Bitfinex would be successful in long term. They could trade them on the market, um, so sell them, for example, and they could uh, also wait for the redemption. So we uh, committed to redeeming those tokens at $1 uh, face value with the revenues of the exchange. So as soon as the market started, so after one week, so it took one week to bring back the platform up and running. I remember that probably slept two hours in a week. Uh, I was completely destroyed after, after seven days, but you know, we, we had to make it, we had to put every, everything, everything we had to, to, to start trading again, because if you wait too much, you don't have, you know, people will, will just disappear, will go away. And, uh, you know, there is no chance of success anymore. So we knew that we had to restart trading within one week. So when, as soon as we started trading the BFX token, people started selling the, their BFX tokens and the price went from one to 20 cents. You know, that they thought, well, these guys will never make it. But after the first days, we had the first days we had a huge outflow of, of Bitcoin from the platform. You know, customers, of course, were withdrawing in panic. But um, after a few days, after 10 days, 15 days, we were back the first exchange by trading volume. So at the end of June, at the end of August, we were the first, again, the biggest exchange by trading volume. And so by the end of September, we redeemed the first BFX tokens. So people were, th were, were like, holy cow, these guys, these guys are making money. They are buying back the tokens. And so the price on the secondary market for these BFX tokens started to go up. And so then October came, November came, we, we, we kept making more money because also that coincided with the bull run 
right? They started bull run by the end of 2016, going to 2017. That was one of the most incredible years for, for Bitcoin and the crypto ecosystem. So we were making really good profits, buying back the BFX tokens. So more and more people start to convert their BFX tokens into equity. So that's how basically we got almost 300 shareholders for, for, for iPhoenix. And um, that was incredible. I think by, by in seven months, I think by, by April 2017, all the outstanding BFX tokens were either you know, converted, redeemed, or or converted in, in, in equity. So it's I really like and love to think about the, that part of the story because I think that in in these moments of weakness is how you really assess the team. And I must say that no one in our team left the company. Everyone was focused on make sure that uh, the platform would be profitable to make everyone whole. Yeah, to this day, it's one of the biggest comebacks uh, in, in crypto history. And I also really appreciated um, the story of the BFX token and how kind of you use crypto economics to kind of to make it work for you guys. So, yeah, uh, tipping my hat uh, to you guys. So you, you talked about uh, kind of, you know, switching out the financial rails and kind of settling things on blockchain because it makes sense. And I concur 100 percent. So kind of we have recently started building um, financial um, infrastructure that kind of crosses the chasm from uh, blockchain to uh, legacy finance um, with Gnosis Pay and other such integrations. And I was absolutely flabbergasted at the stack that kind of like the financial world runs on. It, it's unbelievable. So you guys in that vein, you guys started um, a decentralized exchange in 2017, back when these were kind of um, still fairly marginal. So um, it was ETHFINEX and it later rebranded to Diversify and then now Rhinofy. How do you juggle this? So basically in, in terms of trustlessness and so on, obviously having um, a DEX is preferable to having a centralized exchange in some sense because kind of like everything is transparent, kind of the spirit is there. So how do you see the coexistence of both of these branch branches? So I think that the beauty of uh, of Bitfinex and this group that is always, you know, there is this meme of uh, being in for for the tech, right? So then you know you have the people with uh, big uh, gold chains and, uh, and and so on. But we have been always really in in this field for for the tech, right? We always try to push the boundaries of of tech, even when uh, DEXs were not a thing. We thought how we could make sure that people if people are not comfortable leaving their tokens and their money on the exchanges, how we can make the the experience, their user experience great in a sense that centralized exchanges have the advantage of being extremely fast in execution. Because the think about the fact that now the average latency of an order on Bitfinex is around, uh, in the internal system is around uh, 10 microseconds between 10 and 20 microseconds, right? So that's how you scale. You can handle any sort of volume the and so on. And you can only do that through uh, a centralized platform because even the fastest blockchains like Solana, they have a block time of 400 milliseconds. So that is incredibly, incredibly longer. It's like an eternity compared to the latency that you have in a centralized system. But, you know, the problem there is just uh, something in physics called the speed of light. Right, the information goes at to the speed of light, and so you cannot move information if you have multiple nodes that have to concur to the same information. They have to agree. They have to exchange information. That speed is the speed of light, and uh, so as fast as it can be. If you have to have two different uh, do different round trips around the world because you, one node could be in Tokyo, one could be in Switzerland, the other one could be in the U.S., then you know, you get to 400, 500 milliseconds of a minimum time that's needed for blockchain and so forth DAX to in terms of latency. Now, so the way we approach this is what are the pros and cons of a DAX compared to a centralized exchange? And for us, the most important part was the having the ability of keeping it, uh, your own custody while trading. So being able to uh, trade as fast as fast as you can with the normal uh, centralized user experience, but at the same time 
keeping control over your custody. I think that is the holy grail of uh, of finance, if I have to think it through. Of course, the, the other important part is uh, the transparency, right? So you want to make sure that people don't front around you and so on. But I think that the transparency can be... On one side, of course, on the DAXs, you have transparency, but you have enormous latency. So you can also, we there were also cases in which people were front run um, because, uh, you know, they, you know, looking at the mempool, looking at, um, you know, the, you know, have even the, um, the, the validators, for example, who can front run people because they receive uh, transactions a little bit sooner. So there are also problems like that in, in DAX, right? So to me, the holy grail and the big mm, advantage of a DAX is the ability of, of uh, letting people control their own funds. So that's why we started FNX in that way. As of today, I think, you know, the there is another, um, or there was another interesting kind of advantage of um, DAXs versus centralized exchanges. That is privacy or anonymity, if you want, if you will, right? So, with DAXs, you usually log in with, you, with your MetaMask, and uh, so you know, or whatever other wallet you have, and then you you can start trading immediately. You don't have to go through KYC, AML, and so on. But uh, my opinion, as of today, seeing also Mika and the other regulations that part, that advantage of DAXs will come to an end. I think is, you know, regulators make it, made it abundantly clear that uh, if uh, you trade against uh, someone else and that someone else is uh, a person that is sanctioned, the fact that you are using a DAX is not going to save you or create a justification for you. So basically what will end up, in my opinion, from what I gather, being the only advantage of DAXs that is still a great advantage is the ability of keeping your own custody of the funds and not being subject to potential exchange hacks. So we'll see. The future is um, will will tell us who, you know how things these things will develop. I wanted to, I wanted to ask another question that sort of relates in a bit to the sort of Bitfinex journey, but also like more generally to your journey, like as an entrepreneur. I mean, you mentioned sort of like how the team sort of made it through all of that. And, and like you mentioned also like how you, you have to focus on tech. I'm curious, like, how do you think about, you know, building an organization and like company culture and, and like, what are sort of the main learnings you've had in that regard? So far, between Bitfinex and Tether, we had a really, really, really low number of uh, defections. I think in, uh, I don't know, in, in, in 10 years, we could count it less than, you know, two, three percent. People stick here. Um, I think the reason is the culture. The culture is um, really about openness, um, kind- kindness. We. There is a first rule that I have. So myself and um, and a couple other people in the in the um, chief positions, we do every single final interview, right? So we still do all the final interviews, although we are growing. The number one rule is never hire. Don't hire a toxic person. So you sometimes have amazing talent, but behaviorally could be challenging for the team, right? You don't, if you hire the wrong person, that person will affect 10 10 people around them, right? So the ability, sometimes, you know, and as I said, I've been a developer. Sometimes you see developers that get all cocky because, you know, they are right and everyone else is wrong or because they have, you know, the, they they are the only ones that, uh, that have the truth on how things should be architect, right? And so we are really careful in in hiring people that understand the value of collaboration within the teams. And that's something that uh, so far over time allowed Bitfinex to remain uh, one of the top platforms in the crypto um, ecosystem while having probably one-tenth to one-fifth of the um, the headcount of, uh, of other platforms. So... 
that's that's of something about uh, you know creating a healthy team, healthy uh, responsibilities and chain of responsibilities. People really committed to the success of the company, and um, so I, I think you know the the biggest um, takeaway from from my career is focus on the team, focus on the people, and uh, you will have success. No, I really appreciate you sharing that. Let's talk about Tether. Like, how how did Tether get started? Tether started in 2014 as a really simple product, a simple idea. In 2014, there were just few exchanges, right? You could count, you know, the exchange of the cryptocurrency exchanges on the on the uh, fingers of two hands. There was Bitfinex, of course, Bitstamp, Kraken, Coinbase. There was OKCoin. Okay and uh, BTCC, not not many others, at least not many relevant others. And so there was, um, into the, at the end of 2013, it was also the first moment in history that Bitcoin broke $1,000 price. And uh, across multiple trading venues, right? So you had maybe $1.2,000. At any point in time, there was a huge spread, a, a spread across exchanges, up to 20%. Right, so some exchanges were at 1.2k, others were at 950, others were at 1,000. The reason is that by then the work of um, the arbitrageurs was not possible. The arbitrageurs are those kind of traders that sell Bitcoin where on the exchange where the price is higher, they sell it for dollars, they take the dollars, they move the dollars on the exchange where the price is lower. They use these dollars to buy Bitcoin and then send the Bitcoin on the exchange where the price is higher and so on and so forth. They do it in the loop so that this, the, the spread across these uh, exchanges will go down and they all get aligned. In order to do this, you have to you need to be able to move Bitcoin from one exchange, exchange to another, but also you need to be able to move uh, dollars from one exchange to another. But... Um, Moving, do- moving Bitcoin takes 10 minutes, right? The average block time of Bitcoin is 10 minutes, but moving dollars is extremely more difficult. Sometimes, you know, international wires might take one day, two days, three days, seven days, and there, there is the weekend. So your trading opportunity, your arbitrage opportunity is long gone if you wait so much. So the really simple idea around Tether was, okay, let's reuse the incredible technology that uh, Bitcoin created called blockchain. Let's just put the US dollar because it's the most used currency in the world. Simple as that. Back in, back in, in at that time, you know, there was no Ethereum yet. So the way to do it, the only platform that allowed that was called OmniLayer. That is a color coin system um, that is based on Bitcoin. So Tether was born on OmniLayer. Fast forward many years, and you know, Tether started as a simple project to allow our, to make more efficient crypto trading. But in 2019, 2020, with the pandemic, something changed. You know, with the economies of the world, especially in emerging markets, to developing countries, they they started to have big issues. We are seeing Argentina, Turkey, Vietnam, Venezuela, so many others. You know, all these. National currencies are re-devaluating against the dollar really, really quickly. In some cases, I think that Argentina pesos lost 98% against the US dollar in five years, and uh, more than 80% was lost by the Turkish lira. So, all the people, people living in those countries where you know these people need needed solution, needed a way out, needed a way to save their wealth, right? Who is not about speculation here? Is about a father of a family that works an entire year to earn, for example, Turkish liras at the end of the year is poorer compared to the beginning of the year just because its national, his national currency went down the bin. And so people have a survival instinct and so they started to look at solutions. And USDT was already the most used solution uh, that, uh, that could uh, help them. So... USDT became basically this uh, this in, this currency that uh, the world started to use and to um, to build on. All the in all the merchant markets now, if you go in Argentina and Buenos Aires, you have find ton of places where you can you can pay in USDT. 
Same happens in Venezuela and so many other countries. And I must say, we didn't envision that. We didn't think about it. When we created Tether, was really a simple idea. And so we are humbled by the success of, of, uh, of USDT. I always say that before 2022, we never had even a marketing team for Tether. And so, you know, people started using our product in the way they saw more fit and uh, in the way that was more helpful to them. So that, that is really exciting. Can you give us an idea of how it's used today? So kind of in, in percentage, kind of like what, what percentage is kind of like what I would call normy use. So kind of like the, the Turkish father or the Argentinian family mother who kind of uh, keeps uh, their salary in tether in order to spend it as efficiently a couple of months later. So it, it's really, just to say, it's really hard to pinpoint the exact figures because, in, you know, the, we are living in a decentralized world and uh, so information is scattered. But um, as of today, I think that uh, at least 50% of, uh, of the tether in circulation, the USDT in circulations, in circulation are kept as uh, savings and not necessarily used for trading. So that is a great achievement because I think it changed, it, it, it happened in, in four years, right? In four years, people had this uh, incredible bad situation of suffering, uh, financial suffering. And I always say um, that um, we are kind of in a weird, weird, weird situation at Tether because we, we see that if we have more success, means that the world is going towards a worse place, right? Because, you know, the, that's the, the reason for all these countries to look at the dollar is because something is not working in their own country. And the easiest way to have access to the dollar is USDT. So in one way, someone could see, it, of course, it's a success for a company, but it's, it's, um, it's saddening to see that, uh, you know, to understand that success is also determined by imparting competency uh, from, from um, you know, um, financial management for of many countries and uh, non, you know, um, the inability to preserve preserve wealth from government in these countries that led people to fly towards a more a safer currency. You've moved um, stack, or you have kind of added stacks over um, the last couple of years. So as you said, kind of you guys started out on Omni, um, and then you added Ethereum, and now. They see uh, USDT is natively issued on a number of networks. How do you determine which chains to um, to issue natively on? So basically, basically, if you if you look at payments on chain, Tether on Tron is kind of where it's at at the moment. So how how how, how do you kind of see these movements? How do they happen? Um, do you plan them? Uh, yeah. So we listen to communities and. Every time we deploy USDT on the chain, we do an enormous amount of the diligence that goes from the security of uh, of the blockchain. So how is you know the um, the technology is built to the interest of a real community and the actual ecosystem around such blockchain. Right? It's pointless to list to add USDT to a chain that doesn't have users or interest because then you know we we expose ourselves to risks while not, you know, getting any benefit in terms of adoption. So the interesting, and I get this question a lot, the interesting thing about Tron is that, you know, we launched first Ethereum, well, first there was a, a Tether Omni, then um, there was a USDT was launched on Ethereum, and then was launched on, on Tron. People choose whatever they want, right? So people choose the transport layer of USDT they want, we, just to be clear, we are a centralized stablecoin, so all our features and capabilities are shared across the different blockchains. For example, we can freeze assets, it's, it's public, right? We can freeze wallets working, for, working with law enforcement. That is something that applies to all the different blockchains. And so people just choose the transport layer, so the blockchain for USDT, that is more fitting to them. And 99% of, uh, of the people would always choose something that is faster and something that is cheaper. Let's think about how what I said before. So Tether USDT has becoming 
really important for hundreds of millions of people across the world, especially in emerging markets and developing countries. You know, we, we don't support US customers and uh, I don't think Europeans need stable coins either. That is, that is my take. So the vast, vast majority of Tether users is all in emerging markets and developing countries. Countries that we, as we said, they, you know, their national currency is losing really quickly against the dollar and where, you know, one, every dollar of transaction fee is extremely important. We have, we have seen after 2018, so 2017, how many times the Ethereum gas fees, they grew through, you know, from uh, $2 to $50 to $100, right? Every time there is some excitement, the gas fees goes, go crazy high. And so Tron had really low gas fees for, for a long time, right? Tron had this, um, is more centralized as this uh, system of validators and for a long time had, um, you know, proof of stake compared to proof of work. Ethereum moved from proof of work to proof of stake more recently. So, you know, the Tron was a simplified approach to EVM that was extremely effectful because, you know, all these in uh, think about Africa and South America and the Central America, certain countries of Asia, you know, even 50 cents of transaction fees are really high, right? So maybe they earn $50 to $200 in a month. And if they have to spend $5 every time they send a transaction, that is not a product for them. The interesting is sometimes, you know, the, the Ethereum community criticize uh, us a little bit because, you know, the, Tron is still heavily used. The reality uh, is that uh, Ethereum had to, for Ethereum it took four years to be, to come up with the layer two solutions that would bring down the, the fees to a bearable uh, value, right? For the vast majority of the users of blockchain. And so for, if you give to a competitor that would be Tron in this case, four years of uh, first mover advantage, of course, it's really hard to take it back, especially when also all these layer sol two solutions built on Ethereum are completely, uh, are anyway competing with each other as well. It's like, you know, the Simpson meme where, you know, with the Scots, where basically um, in the end, everyone ate each other. And uh, the, the reality is that we, um, we are seeing, you know, we, we think that it's, it's really important for USDT to be more diversified on different uh, blockchains. It's important that although these blockchains will start to grow, an ecosystem will keep transaction fees low and will keep the transaction speed high in order to fulfill the interest and the need of, um, of emerging markets populations. Um, Tron transaction fees um, have moved up significantly though, right? So we see a TRC20 transfer currently is around $1.50. So it's it should be impacting the people that are served best by by Tether. Yes, exactly, and that's why we are seeing um, opportunities on uh, launching other chains. Recently, we launched on uh, Celo. Um, well, two days ago, we launched on Celo that has lower transaction fees, is VM compatible, and um, we are also looking at Polygon and other uh, layer twos. What I'm saying is that now that uh, hundreds well, actually tens of thousands of integrators like merchants, payment solutions have adopted Tron is really hard for the layer two solutions on Ethereum to compete, right? You, they had four years of first mover advantage. So you started, you started kind of right, focusing on this arbitrage use case. And now there is, you know, kind of Tether has like branched out and there's a lot of this, you know, payments use cases or people using it as a store of value. I heard in some interview, you, you talked about uh, Tether as a sort of over collateralized bank account. I'm curious if you think of like the long term vision for Tether, like where do you see it going? So Tether evolved a lot. I mean, we... <laughs> we were the black sheep of uh, of crypto. Maybe we still are, and uh, I'm not realizing it. But um, we were the 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 black sheep of crypto for a long time. Um, you know, I think the the mistake we made uh, is that we we thought that uh, 
keeping your head down and uh, you know not being you know not entering and not entering in uh, public disputes and not being you know uh, present on Twitter and so on would um, would work for us. Um, you know, it's like okay, if I work, if I keep my head down and do a good job, people will be okay with me, will will be happy, and we realize that we are good people. And then uh, you know that that didn't work well, and uh, you know we started to understand that uh, people needed um, and no, um, heavy quantities of transparency, and I think you know it's uh, it is rifled to to ask for that. And um, so we changed, I think, heavily uh, in the last years, the amount of information that we publish, the way we managed our services much more public. We came up, we were the first ones to, to, to come up with an attestation with a breakdown of the reserve showing how much we have in different things. We were subject to many critics that we took well and we applied to the company so that we could improve also our service. You know, I'm sure you remember the commercial paper part you know, although there was a lot of nonsense, like we had Evergrande and, uh, you know, all the Chinese papers and so on, that was uh, really stupid. But anyway, um, we we proved that uh, we could convert everything or almost everything in US T-bills. As of today, so the community was asking us to do changes and we always listened to the community. We made these changes. Um, as of today, I think we have, well, as the 31st of December 2023, we had... $80.3 billion in U.S. Treasury bills that would put us at the 20th, as the 20th country in the world as own owners of a U.S. debt. And um, when it comes, I think, to the three months Treasury bills owners, we are the third one as in terms of uh, holdings. So mm, at our, at the majority of our T bills are all short terms, like within 90 days. And so now, nowadays, in the last attestation, we published um, other numbers. Like we have, we had 5.2 billion on top of the 100% reserves that are covering all the issued USDT tokens. So, means meaning that we had Tether is making good money, right? In a quarter, we made almost three billion dollars, and. Um, we could have dividended any other company, any other normal company. Imagine a bank that would make $3 billion in profits. Oh my God, they would distribute these profits left and right to all the shareholders up to the last cent. But uh, no, with Tether, we decided to keep the vast majority of these profits within the company up to $5.2 billion as the last quarter. So that uh, Ren Tether end up in being $5.2 billion over collateralized. So... Of course, banks are upset because, you know, banks are lending out 90% of their portfolio and their balance sheet. And uh, Tether instead is doing the opposite. It's actually accruing more money and keeping it to show that um, you can build something that is safe. You can build a financial tool that is, uh, that is safe and doesn't need to lend out people's money. And so that's... Um, that's what I uh, what I like about Tether, right? This ability of uh, of uh, revolutionizing how you know some certain things in finance are done. So um, the yield on uh, U.S. Treasury bills has gone up enormously over the last year or so. Have you ever thought about kind of um, making USDT in some form yield bearing and letting people who actually use it and hold it? participate in that windfall? So that is a really interesting one, right? So I get this a lot as well. The reason why, there are two different reasons why we cannot do it and doesn't make sense for us to do it, is the first one is that if you start uh, giving out interest and sharing interest, that becomes a financial product that then becomes a security. So that's something that is, I don't think is, is, is a good approach. So I think that many of the products that uh, are the stable coins that are trying to do a stable coin that uh, provides an interest are going to end up in having some issues with the, with the US regulators and uh, other regulators. But also, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a scientific person. And uh, when I create a product, I always think, how, for whom, 
this product is created for and uh, who should who is going to use this product if you live in Argentina where the intraday volatility of the uh, the um the Argentina pesos is higher than 4 to 5% does this really matter that at the end of the year you get 4% and on the other side if we get that 4% we can create a really incredible stable product that can that is helping hundreds of millions of people so that's why i think you know if you are in the US, you have already the best banking rails. You have already the US dollar. So if you put money in a stable coin, you expect to receive an interest, right? Because that's a concept of a saving account and a checking account. On a saving account, you want to have an interest. But everywhere else outside the US, for all the people outside the U.S., the interest is in, especially the ones living in emerging markets and developing countries that are the actual users of a stablecoin, then that 4% is not really meaningful because what they care about is to have something that protect themselves from a much worse situation. So I, I totally understand uh, that reasoning. Of course, one thing that did happen like a few years ago that sort of like along these lines, right, is that a lot of the usage of Tether or of USDT was that people hold it on exchanges, right, to trade. And and then I think, you know, Binance created their BUSD. And, you know, I think it was because they say like, well, all these people holding, you know, USDT there. And of course, the sort of profits of that um, you know, could with Tether. And they were like, okay, let's if we can swap this out with our own stablecoin, right? We can we can capture that. So I'm curious, do you think that might be a path where basically USDT would incentivize like some of these large platforms where massive amounts of uh, USDT get held, or do you see that as a sort of competitive threat? Well, I know that uh, some of our our biggest competitors are kind of doing that, right? So you know, I know that. Uh, from um, that uh, some of our competitors are paying big institutions and exchanges to hold their stablecoin. Again, to me and uh, to you know many legal teams that we talk to, that ends up in you are giving interest to, to someone else, hence can become or can be considered security. So the point is that Tether today is uh, $102 billion in market cap. Maybe it will go down. Maybe someone else will create a better solution. But we are not, look, again, we are keen for the tech. We are keen for the innovation. If we become the second biggest stablecoin or third biggest stablecoin, as long as it's safe, as long as it follows our ethos, that's fine. We are happy with it, right? So we don't, we don't have to be forever the first. We need what we like is to leave a sign in terms of innovation, a utility, and how with our technology, with our passion, we can we can change the world. And if someone will create something better, that's fine. But I believe that creating, trying to, you know, be com to compete and trying to reduce the security, also in this case from a sec the legal side, right? So if you if you start doing more and more things, if you can, if you keep adding flavors to the stable coin and you start doing this and that because you are scared to become the second or the third or losing market cap or losing market share. Look, I mean, that's not us, right? So we, we believe that the simpler it, it is, the safer it is. So if you start adding all these nuances, eventually you will fall in an issue and that could endanger the stable coin. So again, Tether has more than 300 million users across the, the world. And so the only thing we do care about is that it's safe. Your main um, USD stablecoin competitor is USDC. Um, how, how do you see the differences between USDT and USDC? Well, they are focusing mostly and historically, they have been focusing a lot on the U.S. To me, and 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 Europe now. To me, is um, if you look at the U.S. and if you look at Europe or Switzerland, everyone has two credit cards in or debit cards in their pocket, have cash, have two bank accounts. You know, there is no need. To me, I always describe it like trying to sell an ice cream to an Eskimo. 
right? So there is no point. When you create a product, again, you have to create it for, for, for the people that really need it, you know, and uh, those are the ones that don't have access to a bank account. The, there are billions of people in the world that they don't have access to a bank account. There are billions of people that, uh, that are, they are not bad people, they are really good people, they are nice people, but they are not really interesting for the banking system. Because for the banking system, if you are not profitable enough, as a human being, they will you will not, not be on board, right? If you're not putting all your salary and if your salary is not enough, is not big enough to justify, you know, their outdated, you know, financial uh, infrastructure, then they will never accept you as a customer. For all those people, there is USD. We were clear, you know, when we saw the pandemic and all these emerging markets issues happening, we were clear that is our crowd. That is the people we want to serve. We see our competitors always trying to play the game of Wall Street and be want to be, you know, um, the stablecoin of institutions. But these institutions have already the best banking rails. So I think there is a big. So the biggest difference in I think is strategy. So we want to be the last, the stablecoin, the dollar for the last mile, right? For for the for the normal people, um, we think that bankers have already too much. What are your thoughts on decentralized um, stables? So basically, uh, things like uh, Dai, Rai. I mean, so basically, there's different flavors, right? Like fully collateralized, collateralized with assets that may be difficult to get a price feed for, under collateralized, algorithmic, and so on. Do you see those gaining ground in any way? Because kind of the way that centralized stable coins work is we leverage heavily the existing financial in infrastructure and kind of are exposed to financial infrastructure risk that kind of pertains to the to, to, to the legacy system. H how do you see that play out in the future? Let's go with um, a little bit of history, right? So while we think about algorithmic stablecoins, we think about Terra Luna. We all know how it ended up, right? So I was quite vocal in the months before um, saying to many people, look, Terra Luna is, is going to be going to blow up. And uh, many answer me, well, you are going to say that because uh, Terra Luna is going to eat up all Tether market share. And um, the, But the, the interesting fact is that it's easy to create a stable coin that is, you know, 1 billion in market cap, 2 billion, 3 billion, 5 billion. If you get to 10 billion or I think 17 to 18 billion was uh, Terra Luna at the peak. Every, the liquidity has to be there, right? You have to be able to pay out immediately. You have to be able to redeem. In, um, in 2022 was April, May when Terra Luna blew up. There was, you could see the difference between an algorithmic stable coin that was, uh, that was made through some... Um, you know, we are the incentivization mechanisms and Tether. So Terra Luna fell because they couldn't sustain have redemptions. So everything started to blow up. After, after Terra Luna blew up, uh, at pu publicly, a group of hedge funds started to short USDT on the secondary markets. So you could see... And recently, I think DCG came out, or you know, there were some um, some disclosures during a class action showing that also DCG shorted uh, uh, during those times USDT for four hundred million dollars. And uh, but there are other hedge funds like Fear Tree and, and and others. They 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 shorted billions of dollars in all together across all these groups in few days of USDT. They kept the price of USDT below one dollar on the secondary markets. Why they did that? Of course, they did that because they wanted to cause a bank run. That is what, what basically happened on, on uh, Terra Luna. So they wanted to cause a bank run where people, you know, if you keep the price of USDT below the dollar or a stable coin below the dollar, what happens is that market makers are coming in on the secondary markets and buying the stable coin for cheap going to the stable coin issuer, i.e. in this case Tether, redeeming for $1, getting the dollar, going 
moving the dollar back on the exchange, buying cheap stable coin, going to the stable coin issuer, redeem it, and so on and so forth. That cause that is in the banking world the start of a bank run. So what happened with Tether in 2022 in May was that Tether was able to pay out in 48 hours seven billion dollars. That was 10 percent of our reserves. And in 20 days, we paid around 20 to 25 billion dollars of redemptions. So that was 25 uh, percent of uh, of our market cap. So there are a few banks in 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 the history that have been subject to a bank run. Washington Mutual, 2008, 10 percent redemption. They went belly up. Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, Silvergate, all these guys didn't survive to bank runs. You know, we are seeing recently um, also another bank in these days had issues. So the the difference between a stable coin that is backed by liquid and real world assets and an algorithmic stable coin is enormous. I don't think an algorithmic stable coin makes sense that work can grow above a certain threshold because otherwise become too risky. It's it becomes attackable by attackers. They tried it with us, they couldn't make it, and uh, they lost an enormous amount of money because in we we were backed and we were solid. They they had and when they tried to attack Terra Luna, they were succeeded, it blew up really, really fast. So when it comes to the other times like collateralize like uh, die. I think they are really interesting concepts. The issue is how you grow the market cap with having extremely volatile assets in your portfolio. Like if you have if you have um, Bitcoin and Ethereum as part of your collateral, that becomes hard because we have seen how in the last four years uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum lost eighty percent of their value. Right, so it's really really tricky. So that pushed die in to my understanding to move towards tbills as well but you know if you are have if you start using tbills as part of your collateral you are no different than than tether or or the other you know centralized stable coins so i think in a way um die decided to decided that the model of uh, of tether was probably the right one and more more scalable one in in the long term yeah, they they added USDC as as collateral first. So uh, USDT, uh, the t bills I think this is something that's kind of slowly ramping up. But uh, for for um, some time, seventy uh, percent of Dai collateral was actually USDC. And so it's just a proxy, right? So I think look the 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 point is, and the question that people should ask themselves is, why you need a stable coin? So what you want to get from a stable coin? Because if you want to have an asset that is resistant to the wrath of God, that no one can take away from you and so on, that is Bitcoin, right? So you have already something that is digital, that uh, that is um, unconfiscatable, that is built to survive to, you know, all the crazy monetary policies that uh, that world is going, uh, is going into. If you want a stable coin that quacks like a dollar, probably, you know, you are still bound to the fiat world. So you need, for a specific use case, a dollar. So why you are forcing, why you are, why we are trying to push all these crazy mechanisms to try to, to recreate a dollar and not using, you know, if you want a dollar, if you're trying to recreate the dollar, it means you need the dollar for something. And you need at some point to exchange that dollar for a dollar, right? For a real world dollar. So if you are in that situation, probably you just want something that has that is backed by a dollar or backed by the closest proxy to a dollar that is USD bills. So, you know, you 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 why putting Bitcoin and Ethereum to recreate the um, to recreate the dollar? I mean, when eventually that dollar that you created through Bitcoin and Ethereum, you have to sell it for a dollar that is backed by the real dollars or by the US economy that would be Tether, right? You cannot cash out easily die. You have to sell it for USDT. You cannot redeem it directly for US dollars. And so that's the point of, a, of the stablecoin is to be able to, to have a link to the physical world or to the fiat world. So that's that's my small rant around the stablecoins. It's just it's not that we didn't think about how 
we can create something better. Well, we have some ideas that are quite interesting, but uh, the, the reality is that nothing is really proven to, to be able to become so big as USDT and maintain its stability no matter what, that without using a heavy amount of uh, physical assets. So US dollars, I mean, especially in this crowd, they are heavily criticized and kind of they are often made out to be something that could kind of could collapse any day now, right? So have you thought about adding an additional product that kind of doesn't just use US dollars or treasury bills as um, as the underlying collateral, but kind of having some sort of basket of currencies or kind of like special drawing rights and yeah, so basically adding like the Swiss franc and the euro and the yen and so on to the mix. So this is a great question and there is a lot to unpack. The The thing is that, so again, if you are scared about the, the US dollar, is probably you don't, in the, the reason why you should be scared is that eventually, like in the Weimar Republic, you might be able to buy a loaf of bread with uh, $1 billion, right? But... I can tell you, and if the dollar gets to that point, the euro is long gone. And uh, that's not about, speak about the Japanese yen. Well, the Swiss franc is probably the only thing that will remain and will survive because Swiss people understand finance better than anyone else. But um, there is no other basket. The only thing that would make sense is gold. What about a basket of kind of like stocks and, you know, in principle... I mean, you would ask yourself, where would the value go, right? And basically, physical values would still be there. So kind of, wouldn't you want like shares in companies and uh, actual physical goods like um, gold, silver? And I mean, th there are representations of those on chain as well, right? Well, if the dollar goes bust, that is uh, the entire... Nasdaq and New York Stock Exchange and all these, the American markets are the biggest ones. So do you want really to have some um, some stocks in the US market? Mm. I, I think if we are thinking, and I like the, you know, this thought, right? So about, you know, what will happen if something happens to the US dollar? But that means that the entire world economy is going towards a reset. And there are only two things that will sa save you, Bitcoin and gold. So every human humanity go went through many resets and they will they always were done through gold never through fiat currency now we have also bitcoin as a, as a great alternative and um, gold on steroids but here's the thing right so usdt has to represent a dollar so with one usdt you shouldn't be able to buy more than one dollar right so for us the USDT is a representation of dollar that is a representation of the US economy. If again, with the dollar you can buy, if we, you know, you need $1 billion to buy a loaf of bread, you will need 1 billion USDT to buy a loaf of bread. It's not our business to make the dollar prettier and, and more solid than the dollar itself, right? So it's just a representation of dollar. If you really want something that is better, then you should, you might want to use Bitcoin or gold. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a huge part of the value of, you know, to something like USDT is also, well, I mean, let's say in crypto, USDT or USDC is used a lot, right? Like, let's say you invest in some company or you do something like that. It's mostly done with stable coins. And of course, the nice thing is you will have a contract and in a contract, it says, oh, $50,000, $70,000, something like that. And you can just send 70,000 USDT and there's no complexity, there's no conversion, Accounting is simple. So like, I think even if you created some kind of other stable coin that, you know, let's say tracked inflation and it's, it's it, from a practical perspective, it will be less useful, right? Than something that just mirrors the dollar. I completely agree. The point, the question that uh, people should always ask themselves is what I'm using this for. So if you're using it to just to have a dollar, then you should go for the closest thing to a dollar that you can find. And that will quack as a dollar and also in the accounting, as you said. So for the rest, there is plenty of other options that uh, that we created in the last many years. Cool. 
Well, let's let's maybe move on to the last topic because I mean we've talked about Bitfinex, we've talked about Tether. So I mean you already are doing a lot, but then I think you started another thing which is uh, called Hole Punch, which is focused on building uh, peer-to-peer applications. Can you talk a little bit about what is Hole Punch and and you know the kind of related things to Hole Punch and like what's the vision behind that? Sure. So with Tether, we we came from um, this enormous learning curve on how the world is going bust. And it's not not just us, right? So then one of the main reasons of crypto is that we think, at least many of us think that um, economy is, uh, the, the real world economy is going towards a direction where, you know, countries are more and more at war among themselves. The economy is getting more unpredictable. And uh, so we created a solution or to, to that, that is, you know, Bitcoin or blockchain based products and so on. But, you know, the, we have this concept in crypto that is called individual sovereignty, where you should be, of course, we all live in a society, but you should have financial freedom. So you need to, you, you, you want to have the, the right to interact with whoever you want, but the individual sovereignty that uh, through financial freedom is incomplete, you need also freedom of speech to achieve that. Because if you have individual sovereignty, but you cannot say anything to anyone because otherwise you get censored or, or, or go in jail, that doesn't matter much, right? Um, and vice versa, if you have freedom of speech, but then you don't have financial freedom, whatever you say can be used to seize your funds or, or make sure that you you are not really free to use your own money. So five, six years ago, uh, myself and Matthias Bus, the, you know, both developers, both really enjoying the, the concept of peer-to-peer communications as we are enjoying the concept of Bitcoin as peer-to-peer money. Um, we both came through from a background of um, uh, file sharing system like BitTorrent, you know, and all the predecessors. And we you know there is an interesting aspect of file sharing systems that I think is really was comparable and is comparable to um, blockchains and uh, and uh, money systems. So you might be familiar with Napster, the first file sharing system, you know, went bust, closed, and now through different iterations, uh, developers try to create different solutions to make file sharing more decentralized, exactly as we are tr- we try to do with money, so all different attempts, right? From um, you had LimeWire, you have Kazam, you have a Donkey, you have a Mule, and then you ha- finally you had BitTorrent. The difference across all these different uh, approaches is that all the different approaches before BitTorrent, they had a centralization point. They had, you know, if you were using Kazam or, or LimeWire, you wanted to f- look for a movie, you had to connect to a centralized index like a, or certain servers that had all the list of all the files so you can find download the files, right? And all these uh, centralized servers were shut down, right? So then people jumped to a ne- next version, trying to decentralize file sharing a bit more and so on and so forth. So, so, so there was this history of file sharing arrived to the point where with BitTorrent, Everything was really decentralized from the indexes. So the list of all the files were decentralized through a system called distributed hash table, DHT. You know, the file sharing itself, the the exchange of the files was completely peer to peer and and so on and so forth. Now with um, Matthias and myself really were fan of of BitTorrent. And so we thought, what if we took the very same technology around BitTorrent, but we improve it we make it available for not only for file sharing, but for real, real time streams. In the world, almost everything is a real time stream. This you know, chat on or Riverside, Riverside is a real time stream, right? So we have tens of streams, audio, video. When we browse is, uh, on the internet, is a real time stream. And so we thought if we can take those protocols and, and we can create a new set of protocols that are free, that are open source, that are private. So we took also all the learnings from blockchain to create a identity, to, to use that encryption that we learned from blockchain to make it more secure than BitTorrent was and, and, and is, right? So we 
we spend five years to recreate the basic protocol technology to create a better layer for internet. I I think personally, you know, when you know the I'm a technologist, and I think that uh, one something that really annoys me is the fact that um, internet changed from the beginning, from the real purpose it was born for. When internet was born, was born to allow people to talk to each other and share information to each other with each other. Every computer had an IP address and still today has an IP address so that every computer could directly interact with the others. But more and more after the year 2000, centralized systems were born, like and so Google, of course, then email, super centralized, and then you know WhatsApp, Telegram, all, all these communication systems are incredibly centralized. They are going actually against, and all the cloud providers are incredibly centralized. Now, 70% of the entire traffic internet is provided by servers that are running on the top three cloud providers, AWS, Microsoft, Google. So is that really the future that we want? So what happens is, and now I, I, we go back to the beginning of this this, this chat, we, we, we are building internet for the best case scenario where everyone is friendly to each other. What if tomorrow, and you sh we should learn from history, what if tomorrow Italy and France will not be friends with each other, or I don't know, Germany and Spain, or I don't know, the US and another country. So what if, and we, we built, and you know, the reality is that all these solutions like WhatsApp are built by a specific company, a single company, and is using data centers in specific locations, in specific geographical locations. So you might see a future where data will be held hostage and used against other countries. If you if you live in Europe, you use WhatsApp. If you live in Rome, you know, if um, you use WhatsApp, every single time you send a small message, it will go through Frankfurt and go back to Rome. Right? So 90% of the people, for 90% of their time, are talking to people that are within, you know, two kilometers from where they live. Yet, every time we chat, data travels thousands and thousands of miles just to go back, you know, to our neighbor or to be to go back to be two kilometers from us. Is that intelligent? Not, of course. Imagine how much governments are spending in internet infrastructure just to create beefier lines, bigger internet lines for people that are talking for most of the time with their neighbors or with their families that are living in the same area. That is really utterly stupid. Sorry to say that, but it, it is. And so this is done because centralized companies and big tech providers are need that amount of information every day to milk that information, to make money, to sustain additional growth on new data centers is like, you know, a circle that, that goes around and keep growing. It's like, a, and it's feeding it, itself without us sharing more information, more photos daily, you know, they, they will never survive. The, the cost of maintaining their infrastructure will crush them. And so this long story to say that we the reason why we created whole punch and kit is to showcase that you know this this interview could have been done through kit completely peer to peer without any central server if uh, whole punch the company that is building kit would die tomorrow kit will keep working imagine if you are in a country right so kit is serverless allows you to do chats we have we created a bitcoin chat on kit with there are 1.5 thousand people today there is no central server. They are talking real time. They're sharing files. You can share any size of file you want because there is no limit. It's just your bandwidth. You are interacting with each other. You don't need, if you share a file on Zoom, you are limited to 100 megabyte because otherwise, if everyone was sharing two big files, then you, you would crash, you know, Telegram or Zoom or whatever, right? But with peer-to-peer, -peer, you don't have those limitations. So what we wanted to create with Kit and Volpunch is we want to, wanted to prove to the world and to all the developers that you can build peer-to-peer -peer applications with a great user experience without having to have central servers. And so Kit now is being used by my many people, have much better quality, video quality, much better audio quality, just because if you, if you are talking to a person living in the same area, it feels like 
you have that person in front of you. Because the latency is the smallest it can ever be because the messages, the data packets will find the shortest path between you and that person. And that between, of course, you, the two devices. It's not magic. It, internet was built in that way, but there was never an incentive by anyone to build it, to use it in that way, because the companies that had the most money had the incentive to make it centralized. And all the rest, all the nerds, let's say like us, they never had the money to build, you know, um, highly successful applications to prove that internet can be become server-free in a way, for, or at least most of it can become server-free. And so, Ted, long story short, Tether found recently, as we chatted a little bit about it, with um, an important profitability. So since uh, we are, as I said, we are in for the technology, we wanted to create the freest, free as in freedom, uh, chat solution that is unstoppable, that is private, and doesn't need, doesn't need any central server. Super cool. So I get Keith is kind of like a basically decentralized peer-to-peer, you know, alternative to like sort of WhatsApp and Telegram. Do you see the same protocol also as a foundation for, you know, very different types of applications? Sure. You On, on the same protocols, you can build a peer-to-peer Uber. One of the scariest things is like, imagine that, um, you know, this baby comes where... Uh, that you you monitor your children, you know they, they are all the data passed through a central server that you don't own. How scary is that? You you should be able to connect directly from your phone to your home device without crazy config needing crazy configurations. All that is possible through whole bunch, and uh, you can build you know peer to peer mapping. You can whatever you think is built today, you can build a whole bunch. You don't know how many, when I talk to other developers, I, I tell them, I showcase whole punch. You can, I showcase how you can build, you know, interaction between two devices without any middle server, providing, you know, one device provides some services to another device without both phones, maybe without any central server. And even developers are mind blown. And that tells a lot about our education. So as developers, when we go to the university, we are taught that the client-server model is the only model existing. You always need a server for, for many clients. That's not true. And we wanted to prove it, and we are going to invest a lot of money to make sure that education will pick up this new pattern because we want a horde of developers to build peer-to-peer -peer applications, that decentralize applications, to reduce the dominance of the elitary big tech companies. I, I hear all of that and I'm a big fan. I, I will definitely check out Hole Punch. The, the one thing that kind of always got me about these peer-to-peer -peer platforms like uh, BitTorrent was that, that there was an incentive layer missing. So kind of people, it basically was very sensitive to kind of people who would Explo uh, who would exploit it by kind of downloading and not seeding. So in principle, kind of like on any crypto infrastructure, you can kind of build in um, an incentive layer. Is that happening with Hole Punch as well? No, not really. So, I mean, Hole Punch is, is based protocols. It doesn't have a token, will never have a token because I believe that um, is a simple protocol that can, well, it's, it's quite complex, but it's a protocol that can be taken by everyone and you can build whatever you want on it. Now, I agree that uh, there were, with BitTorrent, most of the people wanted only to download but never give up their upload bandwidth. This is completely true, but let's think about the other side, right? So if you are building like a peer-to-peer -peer chat and you, you want to use a chat, your incentive is to talk to people. So there is no actual cost for you. It's not that you are running a node that allow people to run their traffic through you. So the difference between a uh, hole punch and a blockchain is that in a blockchain, you have a global share state. So if you run a node, you will receive all the traffic, you will receive you know, the mempool data and so on. With the hole punch, 
you only choose to deal, to talk and to connect to the people you want to because you are creating a, a network with them. So Hole Punch is not a huge, big network, but it is a protocol to create your own small network with only the people you want to talk to because you are interacting with them without any central server. That's the only way to make something scalable. Blockchains are need to use a global share state because you need to make sure that no one is double spending, right? But uh, you don't need that. You don't need, in, in if you are creating a communication system, you don't want to receive messages from someone from the other side of the world to route them somewhere else, right? So it doesn't matter. You shouldn't be a server yourself. There is now this other program project called Noster. They use, you know, they use relays, centralized relays. I always make the comparison between Noster and then and Kit, as in with Noster, you have relays, and so you need to provide incentives to people to run the relays, otherwise nothing will work. While with uh, Hole Punch, you don't need relays, so hence you have a simpler, more simplified network, and you don't have to have incentives because the incentive of people is already talking to each other. For example, now you are in, uh, imagine that you were in UAE, in Dubai, you cannot use Telegram or WhatsApp to call your friends and family because, you know, the, it, the Telegram and WhatsApp are blocked. You can use Kit to talk to anyone and from, from, from there and to there because that's, um, because the beauty of Kit is because it's peer to peer. In order to block P Kit, you will need to block the entire internet because it's not predictable where you connect to. Super interesting. So is, is the underlying technology, is it some sort of whisper network or how does it work? It's used the same concept of BitTorrent. In order to find each other, we use the same concept of BitTorrent called DHT, the distributed hash table, so that um, you, the distributed hash table is, uh, in, in BitTorrent, there are two 10 million nodes in size at the peak, right? So you have all these 10 million nodes that are acting as uh, um, not connection points, but are temporary, database, temporary databases is basically they are key value stores that are storing part of the global index in a really resilient way. So if uh, if uh, you shut down a part of the network, even 1 million nodes, the network will keep surviving and will adapt to the new set of nodes. So it's really the most sophisticated, resilient, uh, distributed database ever created. And we used it in order to allow people to find each other through the four kit. Because if we added a centralized index to Kit, that would be centralized. The, the point of centralization is that you cannot just add a, just a little bit of centralization, right? So either you are centralized or not. There is no, there is no in between because the moment you are a bit centralized, then you are centralized. I'm curious. So one of the things, one of the projects that I've been uh, pretty deeply involved in for quite a while is a uh, thing called Urbit which uh, sort of, you know, envisions basically a different architecture for like computing and an alternative to the internet where basically all of the computers work in a kind of P2P array where, you know, applications run locally. Well, have you looked at Urbit? Do you have any thoughts on the sort of trade-offs between the whole punch approach versus that? So I really like Orbit. I mean, I... I played with it, I think, in 2017, 2018. I, I don't remember when, but uh, I think it's a really not old project in the sense of old, but it is around since a long time. And um, the concept is great. I think, and uh, the way it is designed is also, I really love it. I think Whole Punch is creating protocols for the real world, right? Doesn't, doesn't try to change the world completely starting from scratch. We already have internet. We have we have immediate needs that are creating a layer on top of internet that is secure, that is uh, that gives sovereignty to people. And we are doing it in the most simple way, in the most modular way, because with with Orbit you had it was kind of and the way I felt it is it's a, it's a monolithic approach. You have to take it all, and everything should run on Orbit. Otherwise, it would you know what wouldn't work. But with Hole Punch is we have more than 100 GitHub projects and libraries. You can take bits and pieces and use it and craft it for and integrate it in your real application, your existing application already. Right. So we are 
taken a different approach in order to change the internet. That is giving you the tools to do small steps toward decentralization rather than forcing everyone in a new, completely different ecosystem. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I absolutely. I think that's a fair description uh, in terms of the the differences. Do you see Keat becoming some kind of business down the line, or is it just a sort of public service that you guys want to develop? I think it will remain public service. I mean, the point of Kit is not making money. You know, there is this, uh, sorry, I'm making many references to, to memes, but well, you know, the from Batman Joker is not that he said, it's not about um, uh, the money, it's about sending a message. And for us, Kit is that, right? So we make good money with Tether. It's not that we have to make money every single time we do something. Sometimes it's important to send a message. And there is a pun intended because Keith sends messages. And I think this is a fantastic place to end because it is, it is such an iconic you know, message to go out on. I will definitely explore Keith and hold punch more. I think uh, it, the entire interview was super fascinating, but somehow the whole punch part got me most as kind of like a peer-to-peer and decentralization maxi. If people kind of want to learn more about Hole Punch or indeed Bitfinex or Tether, where can they go to? Where can we send them? So um, on X, there is um, until we replace X with something built on Hole Punch. So just um, <laughs> disclaimer. So you could go on um, at Tether underscore TO or at Bitfinex or at uh, all punch underscore TO or at kit underscore IO or at Paolo Ardoino. So name is your name to find all my memes and something about uh, everything that I do. Cool. Thanks so much for coming on, Paolo. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you guys. It was super fun. <laughs>